Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Cody Martin, and I'm a senior associate here in the litigation department at Miller. We have a great program lined up today, covering recent developments impacting corporate executives. I'm joined here by my co-moderators, Lauren Bridgman and Catherine Pappas. Here is our agenda for today. Next slide, please. We'll have three roundtables covering a variety of topics ranging from DOJ and SEC policy to tax enforcement trends. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Catherine, who's going to be moderating our first panel. Thanks. We can go to the next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Pappas, a member in the firm's litigation department, and joining me to discuss some DOJ and SEC policy and enforcement updates are Saroor Fatima Yantz and Calvin Lee from litigation and Alex Bolio from our international department. So uh, in January, as I'm sure uh, many of our, our listeners are aware, the DOJ issued the Corporate Enforcement and Voluntary Self-Disclosure Policy, or CEP, building on earlier revisions to its corporate criminal policies that were announced in the last couple of years and creating a single policy that applies across the criminal division. So Soror, what does the CEP have to say about individual accountability? Well, in his remarks announcing the new policy, AAG Polite emphasized that the division's number one goal in the area of corporate enforcement is going to be individual accountability. The policy stated goal is to create powerful incentives for companies to self-disclose misconduct, fully cooperate with investigations, and then to remediate the root causes of that misconduct. And the CEP standards to qualify for those incentives, especially where they pertain to disclosures about individuals and the treatment of individuals are especially high. Uh, for example, to qualify for voluntary self-disclosure credit, companies have to identify all individuals involved in or responsible for the misconduct, not just those who are substantially involved as previously. And this would include providing in information about individuals both inside and outside the, outside the company and regardless to their position, status, or seniority. So hypothetically, a full disclosure could, could include a company's officers, employees, but also customers, competitors, and agents. Also, as pertains to individuals, full remediation includes the appropriate discipline of employees. And AG Polite again emphasized in his remarks that the DOJ will be closely examining how companies discipline bad actors and then reward good ones. The CEP does not have a lot of detail about what discipline and reward means exactly. But one thing's pretty clear from the language that full remediation will be likely be interpreted broadly. So that would include disciplining employees who are directly participating in misconduct, failing in the oversight of the misconduct, or even those with supervisory authority over the area in which criminal conduct occurred. So this could create some tricky considerations for companies. And finally, uh, companies with aggravating factors must exhibit extraordinary cooperation and extraordinary remediation. And AAG Polite referred to these corporations as their allies in the DOJ's fight against crime and efforts to bring individual em executives, employees, and agents to justice. So in the context of Dag Monaco's observations that delayed disclosures by corporations have undermined in the past efforts to hold individuals accountable, it's not unreasonable to expect corporations to be under a lot of pressure from the DOJ when entering into negotiations to provide more documents and more information on individuals involved in misconduct in order to stay both on the path to a declination or on the path to major reductions in penalties. So companies obviously have a number of decisions to make on remediation and consistent with earlier iterations, this new policy speaks about the importance of timeliness and appropriate remediation, some of which you just spoke about. What it one of the things it didn't do was provide updated guidance on executive compensation and clawbacks. Uh, and then in March, the criminal division announced a separate pilot program on those issues. So what does the new program require? Yes, the new program becomes effect became effective on March 15th, 2023, and it's intended to increase the personal accountability and inspire organizations to be more proactive in fostering compliance by compensation incentives and discipline. So the three-year program is meant to uh, re meant to encourage companies that don't already factor this into their compliance programs to retool those programs. And it also requires companies entering into criminal resolutions to implement compliance related criteria into their compensation and bonus systems when they enter into criminal resolutions with the division. The program provides for possible fine reductions if companies attempt to claw back compensation from culpable employees with supervisory authority when they were willfully blind to that misconduct. So companies must have initiated that clawback before the investigation 
began and have attempted to claw back in good faith. And those two things are evaluated in the DOJ's sole discretion. It bears mentioning that the DOJ also issued revised compliance program evaluation factors at the same time as announcing this pilot program in March. And these factors give a lot of information on the DOJ's expectations on how these policies on discipline and incentive structures should look. So they fill in some of those gaps from the CEP. Are there any potential kind of practical challenges to clawing back executive compensation before resolving a matter? And does the pilot program have anything to say about those difficulties? Yes, it does. Uh, The pilot program acknowledges that clawback litigation is a process and it's extremely time consuming. And the division applies what is called a deferred fine reduction. At the time of the revolution, the fine can be reduced by up to 100% of the amount of compensation that the company is attempting to claw back from any culpable executive. At the end of the resolution term, and this is a pilot, so that could mean three years or shorter depending on the specific terms, the company has to pay back any portion of the compensation that they were unsuccessful in ultimately clawing back. If the company is entirely unsuccessful at recouping any of that compensation, but their attempt was was in good faith, again, as determined by the DOJ, the division prosecutors can reduce the deferred fine by 25%. And this is great. Uh, The pilot program does not address some of the other challenges involved in clawback attempts. First, the company is going to bear the entire cost of, the often substantial cost actually, of the litigation and uh, efforts involved in pursuing a clawback against the individual executive. So remember, the reduction in fines is limited to the actual compensation clawed back, not just the cost of pursuing. Second, pursuing clawback from an individual may impact the company's overall ability to cooperate effectively with the DOJ's investigation. Companies typically have relied on compensation agreements that provide for an individual's ongoing continued cooperation with any investigations as a condition of receiving certain benefits in their compensation packages after leaving the company. Very unlikely that somebody would continue to cooperate if the, if the company is trying to claw back that compensation. So there's an obvious tension there. Moving from DOJ policy updates to um, the SEC, in December of last year, the SEC announced some amendments to the insider uh, trading safe harbor policies. So how do these adopted amendments differ from the prior requirements? Well, the short answer is that the SEC had concerns some executives were abusing the 10B51 safe harbor to conduct insider trading, and the SEC added certain bells and whistles, including a cooling off period and a new certification to minimize the potential for that abuse. The SEC also tightened up and expanded the good faith language, which which creates continuing liability under under the plans. As far as the cooling off period specifically, individuals typically have a 30 day cooling off period, but officers and directors have a more stringent cooling off period of 90 days from plan adoption or modification. And they have an additional cooling off period of two business days after filing a 10K or a 10Q. The certification is a written certification that says, you know, I'm entering the plan in good faith. And then that expanded good faith language is I'm not only entering the plan in good faith, but continuing to act according with respect to the plan in good faith. And this language extends that good faith requirement to the entire duration of the plan, potentially expanding liability. Thanks, Sarah. If we can move to the next slide, Alex, Um, turning from policy changes to enforcement updates, we'll discuss a few recent developments that we covered um, in our last edition of Executives at Risk in uh, matters involving individuals. So last fall, a former Goldman Sachs executive was arrested in London following his indictment on charges related to an alleged bribery scheme. What are the developments there? Yes, as you mentioned, the Goldman Sachs executive was arrested for his alleged involvement in a Ghanaian bribery scheme. He was originally indicted back in August 2020. According to that indictment, the executive allegedly participated in a scheme to pay bribes to Ghanaian government officials in order to help a Goldman Sachs client, a Turkish energy company, win a bid for an electrical power plant project. Interestingly, Goldman Sachs is alleged to have held a 16% interest in the client company at the time. In total, approximately $700,000 were allegedly paid to Ghanaian government officials. And the Goldman Sachs executive is also alleged to have subsequently sought reimbursement for those bribe payments from the Turkish energy company by issuing some fake invoices for consulting services that were purportedly provided by a Ghanaian consulting company. The executive previously settled charges related to the same scheme with the SEC over a year prior to his arrest. 
At the time, he did not admit or deny the allegations, though he did agree to pay $275,000 in disgorgement and over $50,000 in prejudgment interest. An, an interesting timeline for those parallel proceedings, so we'll, we'll keep watching it. What other enforcement actions have we seen recently against individuals? In December, a uh, president of a New York-based NGO and his assistant both pled guilty to conspiring to violate the FCPA's anti-bribery provisions. These individuals were previously indicted based on allegations that they bribed officials in the Marshall Islands. In exchange, it was alleged that the government officials would support legislation to create a semi-autonomous region in the Marshall Islands. And it was alleged that the NGO president and his assistant planned to use that region to attract investors for business and development projects there. And have those individuals been sentenced yet? Yes. In February, the assistant was sentenced to time served. And as background, prior to pleading guilty, the NGO president and his assistant were arrested in Thailand and held in a Thai prison before being extradited to the U.S. In advance of the sentencing, the assistant filed a submission that pointed to the Thai prison's brutal conditions where she was held for 21 months during COVID and prevented from speaking to anyone outside prison walls. She also pointed to her relative culpability compared to the NGO president, and the government agreed with the assistant submission and supported a finding that time served was appropriate. The NGO president, on the other hand, is currently awaiting sentencing, and his sentencing hearing is scheduled for May. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the SEC and DOJ have both been moving forward with enforcement actions in the cryptocurrency space. Calvin, you wrote about FTX founder Sam Bankman frieds extradition from the Bahamas. Can you remind us why he was arrested? Yeah, sure. For those that don't know, Sam Bankman fried founded and controlled the cryptocurrency exchange FTX. But Bankman fried also founded a cryptocurrency hedge fund called Alameda Research LLC. Uh, the government alleges that Bankman Freed and his co-conspirators misled investors and lenders to FTX and Alameda Research and misappropriated billions of dollars in FTX customer assets over to Alameda Research to make undisclosed investments, purchases, and donations. Uh, and in December 2022, uh, an SDNY grand jury indicted Bankman Freed on charges stemming from the alleged scheme. Uh, just days later, the SEC started parallel proceedings against Bankman Freed. The SEC proceedings have been stayed while DOJ's criminal case against Bankman Freed continues. Uh, both the DOJ and SEC have gone after Bankman Freed's co conspirators as well. Alameda's former CEO, Caroline Ellison, FTX co founder and former chief technology officer, Gary Wong, and FTX former co lead engineer, uh, Nishad Singh have all pled guilty to criminal charges arising from their role in the scheme and have agreed to settle the SEC's charges against them. So after Bankman Freed's arrest, how did his extradition proceed? So during negotiations with federal prosecutors, Bankman Freed actually waived formal extradition proceedings in the Bahamas. So to secure his appearance at trial, Bankman Freed had a $250 million bond secured against his parents' home in Palo Alto, California. He also surrendered his passport and submitted to electronic monitoring. Now, this kind of bail package is not typically available to foreign nationals extradited to the United States. What makes Bankman Freed's situation unique is his access to U.S. assets that the government could use to then secure his appearance at trial, uh, like his parents' home in California. Many foreign executive defendants facing extradition do not necessarily have the same access to such assets. We can advance to the next slide. So as exemplified by the FTX investigation Calvin just described, the DOJ and the SEC both have focused on potential fraud related to cryptocurrency. And in that space, uh, are there other matters the SEC has brought in recent months? Uh, yes, there have been. Uh, celebrity and social media endorsements of cryptocurrencies are now increasingly common, and U.S. regulators have taken notice. In an October 2022, the SEC brought an enforcement action against Kim Kardashian for failing to adequately disclose paid endorsements of cryptocurrencies. Kim had used hashtag AD or hashtag ad as her disclosure on tweets promoting crypto tokens. 
But the SEC found this deficient because she failed to disclose that she had been paid a quarter of a million dollars to publish her post. Uh, she ultimately settled the action for $1.2 million and is also banned from advertising cryptocurrencies for three years. And then in February, the SEC continued its pursuit of celebrity endorsers by bringing an action against NBA star Paul Pierce uh, for failing to disclose the $244,000 he was paid to endorse crypto tokens from Ethereum Max. The SEC also found that Pierce posted misleading tweets that showed an account with large profits when in reality his personal holdings were much lower. Uh, Pierce settled with the SEC for $1.115 million and also agreed not to promote crypto asset securities for the next three years. We've talked a little bit about DOJ and SEC's priorities. Are there any other regulators or enforcement authorities focused on cryptocurrency? Uh, yes, there are. Uh, the New York Attorney General has actually also turned its attention to cryptocurrencies. Uh, in January 2023, uh, the New York AG sued the former CEO and co-founder of the bankrupt cryptocurrency lending company Celsius Network LLC. The suit accuses the former CEO of falsely advertising Celsius as a safe place to store crypto assets while he was actually making risky investments with the money in secret. The lawsuit seeks reimbursement of customers and an order in joining the former CEO from serving as a director or selling securities in New York. Thanks, Calvin. Lauren, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Very interesting panel. And now we're going to turn to our second roundtable, where we're going to discuss cartel and government contracts fraud enforcement trends and key cases as well as some key sanctions and export control cases and other trends we're seeing there. Um, I am joined by my colleagues, Helen Marsh and Connor Farrell, who are associates in our litigation department, and Sam Cutler, who is an associate in our international department. Helen, let me turn to you first, and let's talk a little bit about cartel trends. The antitrust division continues to crack down on alleged collusion in labor markets and in particular to charge these alleged no coach and wage fixing agreements. When we last spoke in November of 2022, the division had suffered two trial losses in wage fixing and no coach cases, and we reported on those losses then. How has the division's record fared so far in 2023? So um, just last month, the division suffered its third trial loss this time in the District of Maine in a case called U.S. versus Manahee. Um, in this case, the division sought to prove that four home healthcare agency managers illegally suppressed wages for essential workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The jury acquitted all four defendants in late March. Um, the acquittal might signal that juries don't buy that wage fixing should be a crime. Um, in this case, there was evidence that wages actually went up, not down. Um, so even if DOJ doesn't have to prove an anti-competitive effect in these cases, a jury might have a hard time um, believing that, that um, or finding a crime if there isn't a victim. Um, additionally, uh, the jury may have also found that the defendants had a compelling story. Uh, the defendants were former Iraqi translators in the Iraqi war. Um, and even though there was evidence of a written agreement, uh, nobody signed it. The antitrust division also has not had much success outside of the courtroom as there have been no guilty pleas by individuals and correspondingly no jail time. The only thing close to a guilty plea was in the District of Nevada in a case called U.S. versus He. Um, just in January of this year, the manager of a healthcare staffing company entered into a pretrial diversion agreement, which imposed no jail time to resolve the charges against him. So while the antitrust division touts this as um, the first criminal penalty secured against an individual in a no coach case, um, this is a highly unusual no jail resolution um, that can hardly be viewed as a victory. Um, we're also keeping our eye on another ongoing trial in the District of Connecticut um, called U.S. versus Patel. Um, in that case, DOJ will seek to prove that a former aerospace engineering company manager and five staffing company executives entered into an illegal agreement not to hire each other's employees. So trial just started this month and will extend into early May. 
that should be a really interesting case to follow because a lot of these cases so far have been in the healthcare sector, and this one is in the government contracts area. So Connor can talk a little bit more about the antitrust division, other government agencies really pursuing um, collusion in the government contracts world, but it, but it just goes to show that this can extend far beyond the healthcare sector as well. So Helen, do you think that the antitrust division will continue to pursue these labor related cases in light of such a poor record? Yes, I think they absolutely will. Um, the AAG for the antitrust division, Jonathan Cantor, stated at the March 2023 ABA antitrust spring meeting that wage fixing and no coach cases are, quote, righteous cases, and we will continue when the facts and the law support it to bring those cases. Um, just last month, DOJ brought another no poach case against an individual um, in a case called U.S. versus Lopez. Like in U.S. versus He, which we discussed earlier, this is a no poach case from Nevada involving a healthcare staffing executive. A DOJ alleges that the defendant conspired to fix the wages of Las Vegas nurses. Um, additionally, DOJ antitrust touts the fact that it has won on four motions to dismiss in several criminal labor cases. Um, because the courts have found that the per se standard applies. The division views this as a victory, so it is likely to fuel the division's new policy goal to aggressively pursue labor cases. So putting aside these labor collusion cases and, and cases that we typically know as criminal under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, and that's price fixing and bid rigging and market allocation schemes, the antitrust division also seems to be making good on its promise to pursue criminal charges for improper monopolization under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, which hasn't been pursued in decades at this point. And for those who are unfamiliar with Section 2 of the Sherman Act, that criminalizes three forms of monopolization, attempted monopolization, conspiracy to monopolize, and actual monopolization. So what can you tell us, Helen, about some of these recent cases? So just to give some background, um, in March of 2022, then Deputy AAG for Criminal Enforcement Richard Powers stated that, quote, if the facts and law lead us to the conclusion that a criminal charge based on a Section 2 violation is warranted, then that's what we'll do. We'll charge it. So AAG Jonathan Cantor followed up with similar statements just the next month. Um, and a few months later, in September of 2022, the Antitrust Division secured its first criminal conviction under Section 2 in 40 years in U.S. Uh, versus uh, Zito. Uh, the defendant was recently sentenced to three years of probation. Um, again, no jail time. Um, then in uh, December of last year, the division unsealed a Section 2 monopolization indictment in U.S. versus Martinez. Um, this is out of the Southern District of Texas against 12 individuals. Um, DOJ alleges that these individuals um, conspired to monopolize the transmigrante industry, which transports used vehicles and other goods across the border for resale in Central America. Um, and that trial is upcoming this August. Do you think these two cases indicate that the division's criminal prosecution of monopoly behavior will become a trend, or do you think that these cases are sort of fact-specific anomalies, Helen? I think that these cases are um, probably just fact-specific fact anomalies. Um, Zito was really an attempted market allocation scheme, and the Martinez indictment alleged a price-fixing scheme, which the defendants allegedly enforced by punishing those who did not participate in the scheme with threats and violence. So the, the fact that DOJ charged these market allocation and price-fixing fact patterns as Section 2 violations shows that it is willing to charge conduct creatively to further its policy statements. So Lauren, I, I think that we'll need to see if the division will charge a pure monopolization case criminally to determine whether this will become a trend. Um, but I think that we can look to Jonathan Cantor's statements at the March 22 spring meeting, um, where he described criminal mon monopolization as a vibrant live area of the law and stated that the division will continue to bring these Section 2 criminal cases when the facts and the law support it. Thanks, Helen. So let's turn to another agency that enforces antitrust laws, and that is the Federal Trade Commission. Um, the FTC has also been flexing its enforcement muscles lately when it comes to labor market issues. And so what has the FTC been up to lately, both in terms of enforcement and rulemaking? So the FTC has been focusing its rulemaking authority to propose banning non-compete agreements. 
Just this past January, the FTC proposed a sweeping new rule that would, blend, that would ban employers from um, imposing non-compete clauses on employees and contractors, and, would, and this rule would also rescind nearly all existing non-compete agreements. Um, the public comment period for this proposed rule ends tomorrow, April 19th. Um, this proposed rule comes on the heels of FTC using its enforcement authority to void three corporate non-compete agreements, um, one at Prudential Security Incorporated, another at OI Glass Incorporated, and the third at R Dog Group SA. Um, the Prudential settlement concerned security guard employees, and the OI Glass and R Dog Group settlements concerned glass container manufacturing employees. Um, all three settlements alleged that the non-compete agreements at issue reduced employee mobility and access to higher wages and more favorable working conditions. Um, the OI Glass and R Dog Group settlements um, alleged that due to the highly concentrated nature of the glass container industry, uh, non-compete agreements impede the entry and expansion of rival of rival companies by limiting their um, ability to hire skilled employees. So, what does this mean for the future of non-compete agreements? Um, so while the FTC's proposed rule is unlikely to become law anytime soon, I think at a minimum it will be challenged in court. Um, the three settlement agreements show that the um, show that the FTC, FTC is serious about using its authority to crack down on what it perceives as unfair non-compete agreements. Great, thanks, Helen. So I want to shift away from labor issues and talk further about procurement bid rigging cases. Connor, the Antitrust Division continues to focus on procurement bid rigging cases through the Procurement Collusion Strike Force, and you've talked to us in the past about what we call the PCSF. What has the PCSF been up to lately? Sure. So the, the PCSF has continued to bring charges in uh, smaller scale domestic bid rigging cases. Um, I'll touch on a few examples. Earlier this year, uh, three New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority employees uh, pled guilty to bid rigging excess vehicle auctions. Uh, the individuals used confidential pricing information to ensure that a company they owned were awarded contracts uh, by the MTA. Uh, in another bid rigging case in January, a military contractor pled guilty to rigging bids on six vehicle refurbishment contracts in Texas. And then finally, another example, just last month, uh, three executives, including the former president and vice president of Avisticom, were convicted on conspiracy and fraud charges. Uh, the executives fraudulently prepared independent government cost estimates and sham quotes in procuring government contracts worth $7.8 million. Now, these are just a couple of examples, but I think they provide a good illustration that you know, despite the smaller scope of these cases, the PCSF is willing to investigate and charge any conduct uh, that harms the integrity of the U.S. procurement system. How about beyond the PCSF? Have there been other government agencies or even within the antitrust division that haven't been coming through the PCSF where the government has focused on um, pursuing enforcement of, of uh, government contracts fraud laws? Yes, that's right. The, the PCSF is not the, the only government entity uh, prosecuting uh, government procurement fraud. Uh, for example, still within the antitrust division, the New York office in February announced that a former salesman for digital interactive whiteboards uh, pled guilty for his prominent role in bid rigging that involved the sale of whiteboards to the New York City public school system. Uh, specifically, the salesman, along with his co-conspirators, enacted a scheme where all parties profited at the expense of the school system. The salesman sold whiteboards to his co-conspirators, and then some co-conspirators won contracts with the school system, while at the same time, the co-conspirators who lost bids were still paid to install the whiteboards. And then another case outside the uh, PCSF, um, Last November, the DOJ OIG announced that the owner and president of 2M Solutions, a security and surveillance system provider, pled guilty to defrauding the government through his false certifications that the company's products were manufactured in the U.S. and complied with the Buy American Act, when in reality the products were purchased from Chinese suppliers. So those are two examples, but I did want to, you know, just sort of overall mention that 
in our webinar last fall, we forecasted that DOJ and the PCSF specifically may begin to bring larger cross-border type cases uh, to build off its recent successes and to align with the PCSF global initiative. Uh, but that has not happened yet. Um, so in the meantime, we'll continue to monitor domestic procurement fraud happenings, which seem to be the, the real focus of the task force. Thanks, Connor. Let's turn now away from cartel enforcement and talk about sanctions and export control enforcement, which of course has been a very active area of enforcement, particularly since the Ukraine war started. So Sam, let's turn to you. Can you highlight some of the key prosecutions that you have seen recently on this front? Sure, thanks, Lauren. Um, as as everyone can imagine, uh, Russia sanctions continue to be <clears throat> arguably the, the primary enforcement priority across the US government, um, from the DOJ through task force kleptocapture to OFAC, to the State Department, um, to the Bureau of Industri Industry and Security enforcing export controls. So in January, um, you might recall that we saw the high profile indictment and arrest of a former FBI counterintelligence agent, Charles McGonigal. Um, McGonigal was charged with receiving tens of thousands of dollars from sanctioned Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska in exchange for investigating a business rival of Deripaska's. Um, interestingly, McGonigal had prior to engaging in the services for which he's being prosecuted, he'd been involved in authorized activity linked to Deripaska's delisting petition with OFAC, which really emphasizes the importance of understanding the scope of the sanctions regulations. And then just yesterday, the DOJ indicted the president of a Florida-based steel trading and distribution company for engaging in transactions with another sanctioned Russian oligarch, Sergei Kurchenko. Um, according to the indictment between 2018 and 2021, uh, John Unsalan bought over $150 million in metal products that are used in, in steelmaking primarily, uh, despite direct knowledge that Kurchenko and his companies were subject to sanctions. Um, beyond Stepping beyond prosecutions, last week we saw OFAC and the State Department add a large number of individuals and entities across uh, 20 jurisdictions to the, the specially designated nationals and blocked persons list. Um, in an action the agency said was geared towards uh, further curbing Russia's access to the international financial system through facilitators and their businesses. And, and we've really seen that be an enforcement priority, um, facilitation uh, of sanctions violation and invasions, evasion of US sanctions. Uh, case in point, among the designees was Dimitrios Sergides, who is a Cypriot national who served as the protector of a trust for which Russian oligarch Alisher Usmanov is a settler, and, and the trust basically uh, exists to benefit Usmanov and his family. Um, Sergei has also served on the board of directors of a number of Usmanov controlled companies. Um, and the State Department concurrently sanctioned a network um, of uh, another Cypriot, uh, a lawyer, uh, Christodoulos Vasilides. I uh, hope I pronounced that correctly, whose who state described as a prolific enabler of Russian oligarchs. Thanks for the update. And so have the sanctions with respect to Russia made it difficult for executives to navigate sanctions and export controls laws and regulations, Sam? I would say definitely. Um, I mean, it, since the, the, the Russian invasion, there has been a, a steep and ongoing uh, increase in the amount and complexity of, of Russia sanctions and export controls that have been imposed. And we're now seeing sort of the fruits of that with an uptick in enforcement of those laws. Um, so far, there's been far more uh, public civil enforcement action under export control laws. Um, as, as none of OFAC's recent enforcement actions have fo focused on the, the Russia sanctions, which shouldn't be read as, as evidence that OFAC is, is less active in pursuing enforcement actions. Uh, historically, OFAC enforcement actions have taken uh, 
much longer uh, than BIS. Um, and then on the criminal side, as we just saw, uh, we've seen a number of, of prosecutions of, of individuals and entities for engaging in transactions, uh, especially related to, to Russian oligarchs, which reflects US government priorities to put pressure on those oligarchs um, in the hopes that they can um, put pressure on the Russian government in turn and, and bring a, a swifter end to the conflict. Um, so what are some of the risks for executives who are considering doing business in Russia? So as we just saw with, with the, the recent OFAC and state enforcement actions, serving on the board of a Russian company or, or non-Russian companies that do significant business with high-risk Russian entities that OFAC views as contributing to, to sanctions evasion or facilitation in some, or, or other uh, conduct that OFAC views as, as de detrimental to U.S. foreign policy interests, um, that can, that can uh, certainly be be a individual risk um, financial payments are always an area of risk due to the high number of sanctioned russian financial institutions which makes conducting payments lawfully much much more complex um, the export of of tangible goods to russia as well as the release of controlled software and technology uh, which reflect affects collaboration and research and development and even Russian company's ability to obtain software licensing um, is an area of concern. Um, the, the new foreign direct product rules uh, that apply to Russia, which control goods that are not US origin, are very complex and difficult to understand um, and easy to, to violate without uh, deep, a deep dive in, in, into their, into their uh, specifics. Um, and while there's not a comprehensive embargo of Russia, um, the export controls restrict export, uh, exports and the use of license exceptions significantly. And one component of the, the, the recent uh, export controls is the expansion of controlled items beyond the commerce control list. Uh, Export controls now cover certain non-controlled items that are listed on the harmonized tariff schedule of the United States. Um, so US companies responsible for complying with, with US export controls now need to, to consult multiple different uh, product lists in order to determine whether they are, they are in full compliance with US sanctions. Um, Another area that that has recently been on our radar is the the so-called exit tax payments um, that the Russian government is requiring companies that wish to divest their Russian operations uh, to pay. Uh, OFAC recently issued new guidance, which states that U.S. persons divesting from Russia, um, where the export tax payment is required. Uh, should seek a license from OFAC due to the involvement of sanctioned Ruff Russian government entities in receiving those payments. Um, lastly, the, as, as has been the case for a long time, the difficulty in, in conducting due diligence to ensure that no sanctioned parties are, uh, have ultimate ownership of Russian counterparties um, or that are involved in, in transactions indirectly. Um, is, has always been challenging with Russia and, and in the current environment is, is no easier. So I think what you're saying then is that the Russia sanctions and export controls issue is, is rather complex and definitely worth consulting an export controls and sanctions lawyer before trying to do business in Russia, right? Most certainly. Great. All right, thanks so much to our second round table. I'm now going to turn it over to Cody Martin, who is going to moderate the third round. Thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, to reintroduce myself again, I'm Cody Martin. I'm here joined by my colleagues, Sarah Barney and Jesse Schwab. We're going to be covering tax enforcement trends, money laundering and fraud prosecutions, and changes to the sentencing guidelines. Sarah, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I want to talk about something from our previous issue of EAR. 
Last edition, you wrote about and talked about the Michael Saylor False Claims Act case here in D.C. and the trend of states using state versions of the FCA to bring tax enforcement claims. I think we got a decision in the Saylor case. Can you tell us what happened? We did. To recap, the D.C. False Claims Act allows for trouble damages against any person who knowingly makes a false statement to the D.C. government. In 2022, D.C. specifically amended its FCA to allow for that to apply to tax claims. In August of 2022, as we reported on previously, the D.C. Attorney General filed a complaint against Saylor and his company MicroStrategy, alleging that he had failed to file income taxes in D.C. In February of this year, the D.C. Superior Court dismissed the False Claims Act claims, although not the additional claims for failure to pay taxes and late filing. The court held that even though the D.C. False Claims Act allows for tax claims, there still must be an affirmative false statement, and failure to file is not sufficient to meet that bar. That's very interesting. So what does that mean for FCA tax enforcement claims uh, going forward? It means there are still a lot of open questions, Cody. Uh, The D.C. AG does seem pretty insistent on using the statute to kind of shoehorn in uh, false claims, so we will see how that plays out. The case is on appeal, so if the Court of Appeal affirms, we also could see some legislative changes coming down the pipeline. The Superior Court opinion also featured some interesting language, saying that other false statements like company records that are false or potentially even tax returns in other jurisdictions could be a foundation for that false statement requirement. Uh, However it pans out, it seems like the D.C. AG will bring another case to test these false statement theories in the near future. Awesome. Thanks so much for that update, Sarah. Were there any other tax enforcement cases this quarter that you'd like to talk about? Absolutely. We had two that seemed especially noteworthy. Uh, In the first, uh, an attorney and CPA were indicted as part of an ongoing tax shelter scheme that resulted in $1 billion in unreported income and over $200 million in unpaid taxes, according to the indictment. This was part of a larger scheme where the co-conspirators would create shell companies to help clients avoid paying taxes through fake agreements, invoices, and other improper business deductions. DOJ has recently made a point of targeting third parties who they view as enablers, especially professionals like lawyers and accountants. Uh, Last year, we saw a similar situation where the House passed the Enablers Act, which would target uh, the prosecution of those third parties, but the bill was not signed into law. Uh, In the second case, we saw a healthcare CEO plead guilty for concealing corporate income. Uh, The CEO claimed personal expenses as business expenses and concealed taxable corporate income to the tune of about $15 million. He claimed costs related to the construction of a personal home, and not just a personal home, a personal home with a pool and a tennis court and a bocce court, and other personal private expenses like luxury vehicles, personal fitness, and his tuition for his grandchildren's private schools. He claimed those as business deductions. Uh, He did agree to pay $15.8 million in restitution, and sentencing is slated for June of 2023. Uh, This is uh, an ongoing trend we're seeing. The IRS recently announced a plan to spend $80 billion in additional funding from the Inflation Reduction Act, saying it would hire accountants, attorneys, and data scientists to pursue high net wealth individuals, complex partnerships, and large corporations that are not paying their taxes. We see this as a continuation of a trend that there'll be an uptick in these kind of tax enforcement cases going forward. Thanks, Erin. That's definitely something we'll follow. Um, I'd like to move on to the next slide, and I'd like to stick with you if it's okay to talk about money laundering and fraud. Uh, We already talked about FTX in an earlier panel, um, but there have been some other interesting cryptocurrency prosecutions. Can you walk us through the OneCoin case? Absolutely. So OneCoin is a cryptocurrency company based in Bulgaria that was operated as an MLM or a multi-level marketing network through which members would receive commissions for recruiting others to purchase cryptocurrency packages. OneCoin entered the U.S. market in 2015 and in 2019, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York brought charges against several executives of OneCoin, alleging that the cryptocurrency business was based on a pyramid scheme that had defrauded investors of over $4 billion. Uh, Prosecutors alleged that misrepresentations made by OneCoin co-founders Carl Sebastian Greenwood and Ruja Ignatova led victims into fraudulent investments. The prosecutors pointed to private communications between Greenwood and Ignatova, where they allegedly described their intent to defraud investors and develop a quote-unquote exit strategy. Greenwood was arrested in Thailand in 2018 and in 2022 pled guilty in SDNY to wire fraud and money laundering charges. 
Ignatova is still at large and in 22, 2022 was added to the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Very interesting. And what about Coinbase? Why is that case interesting? So Coinbase is particularly interesting because it is cryptocurrency's first insider trading sentencing mm. and further evidence that DOG, DOJ is intent on regulating cryptocurrency markets through enforcement. In January of 2023, Nikhil Wahi was sentenced to 10 months in prison after pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit wire fraud in what prosecutors dubbed the first ever insider trading case involving the cryptocurrency markets. Nikhil Wahi is the brother of a former product manager, Ishan Wasi, at Coinbase. Uh, beginning in approximately October of 2020, Ishan Wasi worked at Coinbase as a product manager. In that role, he was involved in highly confidential processes, like listing crypto assets on Coinbase's exchanges, and had really detailed and advanced knowledge of which crypto assets Coinbase was planning to list and the timing of those public announcements. On multiple occasions between July 2021 and May 2022, after getting tips from Ishan as to which crypto assets Coinbase was planning to list, Nikhil used anonymous Ethereum blockchain wallets to acquire those assets shortly before the public announcements. Following the public listing announcements, on multiple occasions, Nikhil sold the crypto assets for a profit. Nikhil and a third co-defendant, Samir Ramani, are alleged to have made at least 25 purchases of crypto assets based on material non-public information provided by Ishan in advance of at least 14 different Coinbase listings. This amounts to approximately 1.5 million in realized and unrealized gain. Uh, in February of 2023, Ishan pled guilty to two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud after initially pleading not guilty last year, while Samir Ramani still remains at large. Thanks for giving us such a detailed view of that, Sarah. And yeah, the crypto space has been very interesting lately. Um, outside of crypto, are there any other fraud cases that are worth covering? Absolutely. Uh, the first is the sentencing of William Sadler, the former chairman and CEO of Averon Pictures, to over eight years in, press, in prison for two separate fraud schemes. In October 2022, Sadler was sentenced in the Central District of California to 41 months in federal prison after pleading guilty to bank fraud and money laundering in connection with the Federal Paycheck Protection Program. Prosecutors allege that Sadler applied for and received $1.7 million in those forgivable PPP loans and falsely represented that those funds would be used to support expenses for ongoing employees. At the time, the, his entities were no longer operational. So the funds didn't go to employee expenses uh, and sadly are transferred almost a million dollars to his personal checking account. Uh, meanwhile, going on in the background, just one month before his sentencing for the PPP loan case, sadly was sentenced to 72 months in a separate case before SDNY for defrauding the investment fund BlackRock. Sadly pled guilty to two separate schemes that prosecutors said defrauded BlackRock out of approximately $30 million. Sadly told the fund that Averon had invested BlackRock funding in advertising when in fact, Sadlier had created a sham company to transfer $25 million out of Averon for his personal benefit, including the purchase of a $14 million home in Beverly Hills. Uh, his two prison sentences will run concurrently. This is a, a continuation of prosecutions coming out of the PPP program. Uh, we see DOJ taking these programs very seriously, creating the COVID-19 fraud strike force to prosecute these crimes. Uh, we might be back out in the streets, but it does not appear that the prosecutions are slowing down when it comes to COVID-related funds. Awesome. Thank you so much for covering that, Sarah. Um, I'd like to move on now to Jesse and talking about notable sentencing. Like Sarah was just indicating, prosecutions have been definitely up and um, definitely there have been some notable sentencings this quarter. Jesse, can you tell us about the Third Circuit's ruling on intended loss? Yes, thanks, Cody. So um, interestingly, in this case, unlike the ones that we usually talk about, this case out of the Third Circuit, um, it doesn't involve the conviction of a corporate executive, but the holding in this case was um, has such significant implications for corporate defendants that we thought it was worth covering. So um, the defendant in this case, Frederick Banks, was convicted of wire fraud and aggravated identity theft in connection to a scheme, in connection with a scheme to defraud Gain Capital Group. Um, and although the facts of the case are not really our focus, I want to just give a little background. So Gain Capital provides retail foreign exchange trading services and banks opened accounts with Gain Capital. He made fraudulent deposits and then tried to withdraw the money from those accounts um, before Gain Capital realized that the money was not there. 
ultimately Banks' scheme was unsuccessful and he never actually got any money from Gain Capital Group through those fraudulent uh, withdrawals. So this is where the, the key sentencing development comes in. So the applicable sentencing guideline 2B1.1, which applies generally to larceny, embezzlement, other forms of theft, includes sentencing enhancements based on loss. And in the underlying case, Banks was given a 12 level sentence enhancement because um, the withdrawals that he attempted to make were over $250,000. Um, this is what we would call an intended loss. Um, and the Third Circuit analyzed the sentencing guidelines and they held that under 2B1.1, loss refers to only actual loss, not intended loss. Um, this is notable because the guidelines commentary says that loss is, quote, the greater of actual loss or intended loss. However, the Third Circuit held that the ordinary meaning of the, world, of the word loss in the context of a sentencing enhancement for basic economic offenses referred just to actual loss and not to include intended loss. And the result of that was that Banks' sentence was vacated. A new sentencing is scheduled actually for next week on April 25th. That's very interesting. And obviously, this is uh, something we're following closely. What's the significance of this ruling? Yeah. Thanks, Cody. So there's two two kind of big significances. The first is that particularly in fraud and embezzlement cases, the government often uses intended, intended loss in sentence calculation. Um, so this could be a significant limit on sentencing in areas like, for example, medical fraud, where there may be fraudulent bills that are never actually paid, or in mortgage fraud, where there may be cases where the value of the house actually increases. So, for example, in, in this case, in Banks's case, the 12-level enhancement took, bank, took Banks' base sentence guideline range from 12 to 18 months up to 57 to 71 months for the um, for the wire transfer charges. So obviously that's a big difference. And then the second significance of this is that the Third Circuit based its decision in part on a 2019 Supreme Court case, Kaiser v. Wilkie, where the court held that when an agency rule is unambiguous, courts can use just regular tools of statutory construction to interpret that rule and are not bound by the agency's interpretation of its own rule in this case, the commentary of the guideline. Um, and this is the first case where the Kaiser holding has been applied to the US sentencing guidelines. So the impacts could be broad and could extend beyond just this 2B1.1 interpretation that, that the Third Circuit made. Um, so I think we can expect defendants to be making these arguments and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on how this develops in other jurisdictions outside of the Third Circuit. Thanks so much, Jesse. That's great context. and. The sentencing guideline also issued some changes to the guidelines. Um, was there anything of note in the new rules? Yes. So the first thing of note just generally is that the Sentencing Commission has not issued any amendments to guidelines since 2018. Uh, the, commission has, the commission hasn't had a quorum for the last four years. So significant in that, you know, we're getting them for the first time in a while. Um, there's a few notable changes, including... Uh, extension of compassionate release criteria, which broadens the circumstances that qualify as, uh, quote, extraordinary and compelling reasons, which is the basis for compassionate release. The guidelines also create a two-level sentencing decrease for individuals that are facing their first federal conviction. So, um, it is important to know, however, that there are some significant um, additional criteria aside from just um, the fact that it's your first federal conviction. So um, in the realm of, of corporate uh, defendants, one of the things that's notable is that there's a requirement that the defendant did not personally cause substantial financial hardship. So that you know could potentially be a barrier for this uh, decrease actually happening. There's some additional criteria as well. The guidelines recommend additionally that for defendants with no criminal records, alternatives to incarceration are generally appropriate when it's a nonviolent conviction. Thanks so much, Jesse. And I thought they were also considering changing the guidelines so that prosecutors couldn't uh, use acquitted conduct in their sentencing arguments. Did anything end up happening with that change? Yeah, so this was sort of a, mu a much anticipated 
uh, consideration that the commission actually declined to vote on this round. They said that they just needed more time to consider the issue, mm -hmm. but just to, to sort of briefly explain what the issue is. So the contemplated changes were designed to address the practice by where a judge when making sentencing can considering can consider not only the charges that actually a defendant was convicted on, but also on behavior underlying the charges for which the person was acquitted. Um, so in the current state, judges are permitted to consider whether specific facts were proven by a preponder preponderance of the evidence standard rather than a uh, beyond a reasonable date standard, just, excuse me, a reasonable doubt standard, just for the sentencing purposes. Um, and this practice, you know, understandably has been controversial and there are several cert petitions also pending before the Supreme Court on this issue as well. So it's definitely an area that's in flux um, and we'll be, we'll be monitoring it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse and Sarah, um, for this great final panel. That concludes our program for today. I want to thank again everybody for joining this webinar uh, and listening to our panelists. We have um, question and answer uh, box down at the bottom of your viewer. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in there. We'll wait a few minutes. And if there are any questions, we'll be more than happy to discuss. Thank you again.